Hi, my name is Roger Zerowicki, and I will be covering the CS50 Meteor Seminar. Meteor is a new framework um, devoted to um, the new kind of web, not the PHP um, making requests back and forth kind of web we saw in the PHP set, but the more dynamic JavaScript parts of the web. Um, thing, me, things Meteor can do includes live updating um, and um, immediately and immediately um, communicating between um, um, users of the same website. For this seminar, um, we have code hosted at my GitHub. Um, you can go to this URL um, and download it. If you know how to use Git, you can clone the repository. Um, if you don't know how to use Git or have not used GitHub, that's completely fine. Um, I will show you really quickly how we can go to GitHub, and there's an option to download a zip right there. Once you download this directory, um, you can get started playing with our code. Um, more information about Meteor can be found at meteor.com. In the seminar folder, I actually have some Meteor projects we can use. So one of the folders we um, have in our um, seminar project is the to-dos app. So if I go into it, I have Meteor installed. So to run it, I just need to type Meteor, and um, Meteor will install. Um, as you can see, um, we have to make sure we installed Meteor, so I'm just going to run it one more time to make sure that Meteor is properly installed. While I have Meteor installing, I can show you some live demos of Meteor sites um, going um, live right now on the internet. Um, I have a demo of um, our um, app. Um, you can access it at the following URL. This is um, the to-do app that we have in our seminar directory. The URL for this is rozu-rabbit.meteor.com. You'll see that Meteor will actually host your Meteor projects for free. And at the end of the seminar, you'll be able to do this as well. So in this, uh, to -do, this is a to-do list app. And um, you can sign in, create accounts, and add tasks. Um, you can create an account, like so. And now, uh, once you have an account, you can add tasks. For example, um, one of the tasks I might need to go um, pick up my laundry. And if you're on this site online, you will actually see this task on your computer in real time. I can show you a quick demo of this by opening um, Rosy Rabbit in another tab with the same URL. And we see that the same data comes up. We can also run it in a different browser. Say I run it in Safari. That way, we're not logged in. So we have the same Meteor app. And once it loads, we'll see the same data we did in the first one. As you can see, um, I'm not logged in here. And when um, the audience checks data, it updates on all the browsers simultaneously. This is one of the really cool features about Meteor. Um, with almost no work, you have li a live updating app that changes on all of your devices at once. If I check the checkbox here in my um, to-do list, we will have um, in my other Chrome browser the um, item checked off. And this happens instantaneously. All right. So it looks like um, Meteor installation is ready now. So now let's go back to the to-dos app and run this uh, locally. If you have a Meteor project, you can just run it with the command Meteor. Once you do this, Meteor will do some preparation to make sure all of your code is in check. And then it'll tell you that the, media, that the project is ready to be served. You might need to um, allow your firewall if, um, if your computer blocks you. So what uh, Meteor is telling me right now is that at this website, local to my computer, I can see what this Meteor project is. Note that right now my app is not accessible to the internet. We'll cover how to bring your Meteor app to um, a live site a bit later on. So I'm just going to copy this URL now and go into Google Chrome. And this is the um, to-do list for the example. You can see they implemented a few more features here. Um, we have different tabs. Um, we have the same account features. And we can add new lists. Now, one of the really cool features about Meteor is that not only can this work on your web browser, but you can also create native iPhone and Android apps through a tool called PhoneGap. So 
some projects will come pre-configured for um, running on iOS, like the Todos app. So all I need to do to run it in iOS is type Meteor, run, and then iOS. And when I do that, Meteor will prepare the package again. And then once it's ready, it'll load the iOS simulator on my command. Note, you can only run iOS apps in, if you have a Mac computer. Um, you can run an Android. Um, you can run your apps on Android um, on all platforms. So now you can see that my um, iPhone simulator came up on my screen. And in just a moment, it'll load with the app. If we make it just a bit smaller to fit on the screen, we see we have our iPhone app. And um, just so we don't get confused, let's make sure we are um, on the same website, the localhost 3000. So right here is an example of the Meteor app I have, the Todos app, running both on a phone and on a web browser. And when I change stuff in the web browser, it Im immediately goes to the phone. And I can delete something on the phone and it changes in the web browser. Now, normally to create a native phone app for iOS or Android, you need to know either Java or Objective-C. Technolo the technology Meteor uses to allow JavaScript to run as your app is called PhoneGap. What your app essentially is is a web browser, and Meteor handles all the tricks, the tricky parts involved for um, bringing that web browser to uh, your iPhone or your Android device. You can see that the user interface is smooth, and it looks and feels very much like a native app. Notice that if I go to the home screen now, I also get an icon. This isn't a website like you'd find in Safari. This is its own app. You can install and delete it if you'd like. We can briefly show you um, what the code for this kind of to-dos app looks like. If you look in the to-dos folder, you will see there are many folders. But um, over the course of the seminar, we'll, we'll understand uh, what each folder is used for. Let's go into the terminal so we can see the files a bit better. I'm going to press Control-C to stop the server. And now I'm back in the to-dos app. I have different folders here, like the client folder, the server folder. And um, these folders simply mean that everything in the client folder gets executed on your web browser. Everything in a server folder gets executed on a server. What I want to point out is that what we had when we had our phone running and our web browser, these were clients. But what's running in a terminal, that's the server. We have other folders like lib, which is library code, like your helper functions, um, which you can use um, on both the client and the server. And then you have a public uh, folder and resources folder necessary for getting your images and other CSS loaded. So if you have Meteor installed, we will continue with uh, the tutorial for um, Meteor. Uh, you can go to this URL, um, meteor.com slash install, to get the command line that I showed you that installs Meteor. Um, we will go through the first few steps to get a better feel about how to install Meteor. But first, I think it's important that we review a little bit of JavaScript. To um, show you some examples of how our C knowledge can be transferred to JavaScript, I've created a few examples. They are in the JS directory. So if in the seminars folder you look, there is a folder called JS. And in here, we have a few examples. Let's open up um, the first example in C very quickly. What we see is your standard um, hello world command. You notice in C that you have quite a few lines. And as CS50 students know, we, have, we need a main function. And we have to include the standard IO library in order to call printf. Let's look at how JavaScript compares. I'm going to open ex1.js. Commented out is what the C code would look like. And the line below is all you need to run in Node. You don't need a main function. You don't need to include any files. And you don't need to return. You just call console.log. This is the equivalent of your printf. And it takes the same arguments, printf would. And um, in order to run it, instead of running make ex1, you would just call node um, ex1.js. You, you write node and then the file. And it gets run. It does not get compiled. It can, JavaScript is an interpreted language. so. It doesn't need to be compiled before it's run. If I want to run um, ex1.c, I have to make it first, and then I can run the ex executable to get the same output. 
Let's quickly cover some other um, JavaScript concepts. Let's look at example two. In ex2.js, um, in ex2.c, uh, we can see that we have um, some code. Let me quickly go to a better text editor that will show these new lines a bit better. All right, here we have um, example 2.c. Here we have different types that we're printing out. And as we know, printf takes different percent arguments to um, access different pieces of data. If we want to print a string, we call percent %s. If we want to call a floating point number, we call percent %f. And um, there's no easy way to call a Boolean by its true or false value. But if you use percent %d, you can get a 0 or 1 for false and true. JavaScript is a bit nicer for us. In JavaScript, let's look at the few differences we have in this file. First, um, you notice that in C, we have to initialize um, every, uh, every variable with a type. S is a char star. It's a string, and it cannot be any other type. N is a float. Um, B is a bool. But in JavaScript, there are dynamic types. That means that you don't need to tell JavaScript what types your variables will be. You just say var for variable, the name of the variable, and then its value. So a var can be anything, really. It can be a string. It can be a floating point number. It can be a character. It can be a Boolean. And um, console log works a bit differently. Um, if you want to print a number, you call percent %d. But um, most values can be printed as strings just fine. Let's run this in Node to see what would happen. I can call node ex2.js. And we get um, printf with the values cs50, um, n as the floating point number, and then b as the Boolean converted to a string, true. What, what about if we made example 2.c? Well, um, we, would, we still have some more um, annoyances with printf. Notice that the floating point number has to be formatted correctly, and that the Boolean can't simply be displayed as true or false. All right, now let's look at example three. In example three, we are um, showing um, how you would use a for loop. In fact, it's very simple. One of the nice things about JavaScript is that it is C-based. That means that a lot of your code will look very similar and feel very much the same. In a for loop, the only thing that has really changed here is instead of int i, we have var i. We can still assign it to value 0, check that it's less than 5, and increment it by 1 with the plus plus operator. Uh, we call console.log on i, and that will print us a um, number with each a line. Let's run it really quickly to see what it outputs. We got a new number on each line. Another thing I want you to notice with console.log is you didn't have to write backslash n for the new line. Console log will print everything on its own line. That's a nice feature that JavaScript gives us. Now let's open up example four. In example four, um, first in the C, we are calling a few functions. Um, notice um, that we have to declare the functions before we use them in main. If we had main first and then add and then high, uh, make Clang or GCC would give us an error saying that it doesn't know what high is. It doesn't know what add is. So you, in C, you have to be picky about the order in which um, you call your functions. Let's look at how you can do this in JavaScript. We have different files because there are a few different ways to do this. Um, one way is a pretty much a direct translation. Because functions in C return types and JavaScript doesn't really know or care about what type you return, you don't write a type. Instead, you just need to write function. And everything is pretty much the same as before. When you have a variable, like in add, we just need to write x and y. We don't need to say x is an int. We don't need to say y is an int. Um, we return with the same syntax. For high, um, we declare it with function instead of void. Notice that whether it's void or non-void, it's still all the same, function. And um, we simply um, don't put anything in the parentheses. And it looks very much like the C code. And below, we can call it below. If we look at example 4b, we notice that um, I've changed a few things. The only thing I've changed, really, though, is the order. We have the same functions, but now they are declared after they're used in console.log and high on lines 18, 19. If you did this in C, make would throw an error. Here, this works just fine. And I can show this to you by calling node 
um, on the 4B example. Another way we can uh, call functions is by saving functions as variables. Like I said, um, a variable can have any type. One of the types a variable can have is a function. So if you look at example 4C, what I've changed here is um, var add instead of function add. And now add equals a function. This function here is anonymous. It has no name. So it's just function and then the parentheses. Um, the syntax after that doesn't change, but you do have to keep in mind that um, you have a variable that you're storing the function into add and a variable that you're storing into high. Because add and high are now variables and not functions, something uh, changes. This is a common bug I see in a lot of people's JavaScripts and something to keep in mind. When I run this, let's see what happens. I get an error. It's saying um, undefined at this point. So it's saying it doesn't know what add is. Because now add is not a function, add is a variable. And you haven't actually given add a value yet when you used it. That brings us to example 4D, where if you want to use um, variables as functions, you just need to make sure they get the value before they're used. Let's move on to example 5 then. Um, here we um, talk about structs in C. Um, in C, structs have this fixed structure to them, because you have to declare them before you use it. And you say, I have a student. And every student has exactly one name, one, gen one year, one gender. It has to have all of them. It can't have any other values. And they have to be specific types. Then um, we can, we can you know, initialize a struct in this um, nice syntax, because it knows the order. So it knows that Roger is a name. It knows that 2016 is a year and M is a gender, because we told it this um, list is a struct student. And then you can print it accessing s.name. Let's see how we would convert that to JavaScript. Um, notice that um, s is now a variable, and there's no type. It's just a var again, because it doesn't matter if um, the type of this variable is a pointer, it's a struct, or anything else. We have a slightly different syntax. Um, this syntax is the object syntax. You might have seen it in JSON. This is exactly, JSON st actually stands for the JavaScript object notation. This is how you um, define objects in JavaScript. We have a key, which is the value, like name, and we give it values on the other side of the colon. And um, one thing to keep in mind is you don't need to have a name and a year and a gender for an object. An object can have no values. It can have as many as you'd like. We can use these objects in just the same way we would use a struct, s.name. We can run it really quickly by doing node example 5.c. Um, um, we can't actually run a C file in Node. It doesn't know what C is. It only knows JavaScript. When we run the ex5.js, we get um, the value uh, which we expected. OK. So let's move on to uh, example 6. Here, I just want to talk a little bit more about JavaScript arrays because they're a bit different than what you're used to in C. Um, arrays are notated not with the brackets like in C, but with the curly braces, but brackets. You can have an empty array like ARR in line 4. You can have arrays with um, multiple values. And you access them just the, fine, just the same way in C. Um, up to line 7, everything seems pretty straightforward. One minor difference is here at line 10. The way you get a length of an array is just by calling dot length. An array can actually be treated like an object. And this object has a length property that you call to get the length of it. Notice that this is different in C, because in C, you have to know the length of your object ahead of time. So another nice thing about arrays is that you can have different types. If you have an array in C, there are arrays of a specific value, either a struct pointer or uh, floats or cares. Um, here, um, you can have different values. I first had a floating point number, then a Boolean, then another integer. And actually, they can change types, too. Look at line 16. Array 2 is changing from being a number, an integer, to a string. Another nice thing about arrays is here at line 19, um, they have infinite size. You can just say, I want the 100th element to be um, the string legit. And um, this doesn't seem to make sense, because the array only has space for three elements. So the n should be 2. But when you do this, let's see what array 3 becomes. We would run this quickly with node example 6.js. Uh, we get this really long array. And what happens is we have the first few elements and then a bunch of blanks until we get our string. JavaScript fills in the array as it's needed. 
let's finally um, go to our last example. Um, here we have a list of different students. I want to talk a little bit about some nice um, aspects of, of for loops in JavaScript. In C, for loops are kind of limited. Um, they're, um, they have a st fixed structure where you have a variable, you have a condition, and then you do something at the end of the loop. And of course, this works in JavaScript, as we saw in the previous examples. But we also have nicer ways of doing this in JavaScript. Um, this is called a for each loop. Sorry, let's go back to example seven here. We can also say um, section is a list. So give me every i or every index in that list. Then we can get the student by just calling section of i. So all of the um, code of setting i equal to 0 and making sure i is less than the length and adding i 1 to i every time, that's taking care of you, for, that's taking care of you rather nicely with this for each loop. Not only do for each loops work in lists or arrays, they also work in objects. Uh, which is also nice. Um, you can get the name of every um, property by just uh, taking a dictionary or an object, like student, and then just saying, give me every key. A key would be um, these properties, name or house. So what's going to happen here is that um, we print out first the name and then the house of every student. I can run this in Node really quickly to um, show you. We get um, um, first, the C style for loop, where we get every object being printed out. And then we have the JavaScript um, style, where you can just print out every key and value individually. All right. Now that we've covered Node.js, I think we're ready to, um, to get started with Meteor. Like I said, Meteor did a great job of providing some ready-made examples for you that you can explore um, on, through this tutorial or in the seminar folder. But here I want to start um, more from scratch. Let's create um, a simple to-do application. This is kind of the um, base of um, what the to-do application I showed you earlier um, is. Um, in, this term, um, in this tutorial, you will see that there's a command Meteor create to create a new Meteor project. You need to call this in order to um, run Meteor projects because it will run um, the commands to create the Meteor files necessary for your project. If you go into the terminal, we can go into the folder called step one. And step one um, will correspond with uh, the first step in the tutorial. Notice there are folders, step one, step two, all the way to five. And each one is um, corresponding to a step in this tutorial. I'm going to open it in my text editor here so we can see a bit of what uh, was created. We notice that there are four main um, parts. There's a Meteor directory, dot Meteor, and that you usually don't need to touch. That Meteor takes care of that folder, and it just makes sure that your project um, will work correctly. We also have three um, files, a HTML file, a JavaScript file, and a CSS file. Let's first start with the HTML file. This looks, um, at first glance, this looks like a normal HTML document, but notice that there are a few differences. One, this isn't actually a complete HTML document. We're missing the HTML tags. This is normal. In Meteor, you're not expected to um, create these HTML tags. That's done for you. You want to begin, um, if you want to create a website, you just need to start with the head tag, define that, and then define the body tag. But if you notice in this, uh, um, in this HTML file, um, we have an in a new tag. We have the template tag. This is not normal HTML. This is a special version of HTML that Meteor makes available to you. It's called spacebars. You can define templates as little modules, kind of like helper functions in your C or JavaScript code. Um, this template would have a name called task. And you can see right here on line 13 that you can call these templates. And what Meteor will do is just fill in these tasks um, for you. Another thing you might notice is a bit different is this each um, function. Um, each will take the, va the variable tasks and kind of go through it in that for each loop we saw in example seven. This um, each can take an, a dictionary or a list, an object or a list, and it'll just go through all of the values like a for each loop would. So if we have a bunch of tasks, this will call the template on each task. Let's run uh, the Meteor project just to see um, that this happens. I run the Meteor project with just Meteor, or Meteor run. And now Meteor just will need to quickly prepare the project, start the database as necessary, and then um, host the app locally. 
we can go to our web browser now. And we'll see that we have a very uh, simple app. Um, so uh, what we saw showed up was actually um, the step one, um, uh, the step one file. Um, let's move on to uh, step two only because I think it will serve the same purpose. I'm just going to change to the step two directory and run Meteor again so we can see the template we just worked with. Yes, a question? Um, if we're getting permission denied, is that, uh, what's the cost of that? Um, if you're running Meteor Run and you have permission denied, um, some of your files might not have the right permissions set. So um, it, you have to check um, where, what, uh, where the permissions are off. They could be off in your Meteor project, or they could be off in the Meteor files themselves. If I downloaded it just now from your uh, GitHub, then what, what should I do to be able to access it? Um, it if you want to make sure you, ac you can access it, um, there's a command you can run. Let me quickly um, write it out so other people can see. I'm going to open a new tab here and go into my seminar folder. Um, chmod is uh, the command to change permissions. And you can say r for do it recursively for every file. And um, a uh, permissions you can try is 0755 to make sure you have full access and everyone else can read. And if you just run uh, this command, it'll make sure the permissions are in, are che uh, in check for the whole directory. Running ls-l can show you the permissions in more detail. This looks OK. Uh, what's most important is that you have um, all three RWX for all the files in the seminar directory. Did that solve the problem? Uh, it says missing operand after 0735. Uh, or it's yeah. 0, 5, sorry. Um, you have to make sure you have a dot at the end of your command. All right, let us quickly um, go back to the local host, the app we um, have. And you'll see that we have a few tasks here, um, as expected. We have a bunch of CSS, which you don't need to worry about. The Meteor tutorial just gives this to you to make um, your to-do list look a bit nicer than the plain HTML. And um, we have the JavaScript file, which I'll go into more detail a bit later, but it just provides these tasks. This is task one, this is task two, this is task three. So this is the data Meteor is getting. One of the cool things about Meteor is that um, changes ha can happen automatically. Um, if I s wanted to change uh, the name of the first task, so it would say this is not task one, and I save it, then when I go to the web browser, you can uh, refresh it, and it automatically says this is not task one. Um, you can do the same thing in any of these files. Make a change instead of to-do list, I will have it my to-do list. And one thing you just noticed, that I didn't even have to refresh. The idea of refreshing is kind of solved for you with Meteor. Um, whenever it detects a file changes, it will load the changes for you. Um, this works on all files, whether it's HTML, CSS, or JavaScript. Um, to show you what um, this app would look like without CSS, I can remove it all. And um, when it's reloaded, you now have a not as nice looking to-do list. Let's put that content back. And um, surely enough, it refreshes, and our CSS is back. Great. We can now um, move on with the tutorial. Um, we, let's talk about um, step two, templates. This is um, what we just saw with um, the different tasks. Meteor will explain to you what templates and how this logic works. But let's just look at the code to see if we can make sense out of it. Um, in very simple applications, like uh, what we have in the simple to-dos, step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, we don't have any folders. We don't have the server folder I mentioned. We don't have the client folder um, that was mentioned. So Meteor will run all the files. It'll run it both on the client, both on the server. 
And if you want parts of your JavaScript code to run just on the client, then you need to make sure um, that you have an if statement, it's kind of like what we have in our JavaScript file here. So Meteor, only if it's the client, then I want to define um, a, template a template helper called tasks. This, um, what this uh, code really d does is it says um, there's an object called template that Meteor provides, and we're going to add a helper. Helpers are um, these tasks, these things like the tasks. You'll see that if we go back to the HTML file, um, we called each on tasks. Tasks is not defined in the HTML, it's defined in the JavaScript. And uh, Meteor needs to know what tasks is when we go into the JavaScript here. Um, tasks is this helper. Helper, you can think of it, is a template variable. And what does tasks do? Well, it returns this list of values. Because it's a list, we can call each in it. So that's why we call each on tasks. And now we have task. Um, what does task do? Well, it has this arrow here at the, uh, after the curly braces. That means task is a template. It's not a helper like what we just saw. It's a template we've defined. And where have we defined it? We've defined it below, right here. All this template does is render a list item, and it calls text. Now, text seems to be a helper, but I'll show you that this is actually still a data member of tasks. When you call each, it goes into the data structure a little bit. Uh, like the for each loop, it now just looks at the first element in our object. Um, we see that text is defined here in our object, so Meteor is smart to know that we're talking about this text, not the helper called text. It just gets the value of this um, text here and displays it as HTML, and that's how the data goes from the JavaScript to the HTML. Moving on, though, um, in this example, we hard-coded those values. Meteor does um, two really nice things for us. Um, besides the live refresh that we showed, it also manages our database. If you had to work with PHP, you had to configure PHP MyAdmin. You had to make sure your tables were all in check. You had to do a lot of work to make sure your data was formatted correctly and PHP could communicate with it. Now, Meteor um, uses a new paradigm. This is a more modern way of handling a database. It's a technology called MongoDB. Just like in JavaScript, we saw that it didn't matter what types the data had. Everything was a var. It wasn't a char star. It wasn't an int. It wasn't a struct. It was just var this, var that. MongoDB works kind of the same way. You don't have to define your tables. You don't have to say a table has a name, which is an int. It has, I don't know, a dollar, which is a decimal. Um, it's just these JavaScript objects, all these vars, essentially. And this is um, a really powerful way to prototype your app. Um, and, that, and that's why Meteor takes advantage of this. If we go to step three, let's um, see at what has changed. If we look at um, the to-dos, HTML, not much. Um, CSS hasn't changed at all. But the small change we see in HTML is we've changed how tasks is defined. Tasks is now a function. That means that every time we want to get tasks, we're going to run this function. It doesn't return the function as a value. Meteor is smart to actually run the function to see what we get out. And it returns this thing called tasks. We've defined tasks on line one, and it's a Mongo collection. Mongo is referring to the database Meteor uses. And um, this new just means, like, let's make a new collection, call it tasks. In MySQL, this would, mean, this would be equivalent to looking for the table called tasks. Mongo has collections, not tables. So this just looks for um, tasks. Now, template um, in our helper for in the template, all we have to do to get all the tasks is this function, find and this empty brace. Um, this is more particular to Mongo syntax. There is plenty of documentation online for how you can make efficient and really useful Mongo queries. But um, something like this is good enough for just finding all the data. Now, one of the issues you might see is that um, we never actually add data. So what happens when we actually run um, step three? Let's quickly go into step three and run Meteor. Notice that I had another Meteor project running somewhere else, so Meteor um, can't, is, doesn't like that. 
I'm just going to quickly close uh, the other Meteor with Control C, go into step three, and run Meteor again. Notice it's starting MongoDB because MongoDB is a part of every Meteor project. So it says my application has errors. Um, that's a nice feature Meteor has. It makes sure your HTML is well validated. Let's uh, quickly look at why this might be. Um, it seems I have um, accidentally copied the wrong Meteor code, the wrong HTML code. Um, if I save it now, Meteor automatically restarted the server. And um, now the app is running as expected. Notice to fix this, um, you can just run the same HTML file from step two, copy it into step three. We can go back to our local host. And now we see we have our to-do list, great, but it's empty. We don't actually have any tasks in our Mongo database. So let's talk about a few ways um, we can do that. If we go back to the terminal, um, we can close it and run Meteor Mongo. This is, um, if you're familiar with how Meteor works, this actually gives you access to the full Meteor, um, the full uh, Mongo's, uh, the full MongoDB for Meteor. Um, notice that you have to be running Meteor first for this to work. So if I run this in a new tab, I can um, make go back to the same directory. And uh, now Meteor works just fine. Um, this is a prompt. Um, Meteor, um, let me make it a bit bigger so we can see. This looks a bit different than what you might be used to. You don't really need to use Mongo. The whole point of Meteor is so that you can use JavaScript. But if you're curious, the Mongo API doesn't use SQL, uh, the, the structured query language. It uses its own language that looks a lot like JavaScript. Um, very quickly, we can find the table via db.tasks. And it um, turns out um, it's telling me, um, turns out uh, if we run find, kind of similar to what we had with Meteor, we can load all the elements. The problem is we don't actually have any, any tasks defined, so it can't get them. We can insert, though. So we can run uh, insert with the command insert. And um, we just give it an object. And um, we just make sure the format is what we expect. If we looked at um, step two, we saw that every task was an object with um, a text as um, the key and whatever your to-do item was as a variable. So we can do something here. Um, we can have it insert a task called I come from Mongo. And we press Enter, and it runs. We can s run find again, and we see that there is an object here. Um, Mongo assigns it an ID, which you don't really need to worry about. Um, what's, you need to, what's important to you is the data you put in is the data you get out. Let's go back to our website. And hey, um, our task loaded. And you can see that because um, Meteor is very smart um, and always refreshes for you, I didn't have to touch the page. It automatically loaded. Let's uh, run some code in JavaScript, though, to do this. Um, like we have Node in the back end to execute our JavaScript, we can also run JavaScript directly in our browsers. You can do this by a feature called inspect element. If I right click on a section of the page, there's an option called inspect element. If you're running um, a browser like Safari, you may need to enable your developer tools before you get this, um, uh, this feature. What we care about is the console. So we will just go to the console at the bottom. Um, now we can run any JavaScript here, like uh, the JavaScript files I showed in the JS example. Um, but now let's look at um, tasks. Uh, we can run our command. Um, and hopefully, I'll be able to make it a bit bigger so we can all see. All right. If we run tasks.find, and you'll see that this is the exact same code that um, the JavaScript file um, uses in step three, this tasks.find. We can run the same thing, and now um, we get some weird stuff. How do we actually get the data? Well, um, we have to run this command called fetch. This is very useful for debugging. Um, what you get here is a cursor. And this is um, a nice uh, way Meteor has optimized fetching data. 
this cursor has all the features for live updating and refreshing the page when something has changed. But it won't get us the data. We can get the data via fetch. And you see we have an object. And it's just like what we had in Mongo, with an ID and the text we put in. So how do we insert um, an item in Meteor? Well, we um, just have tasks. And then um, we can run the same insert command, giving a dic uh, dictionary or an um, object with um, the same format, text, and then um, I come from the console. Take a look above, because when I do this, um, it shows up on the website automatically. Notice that you can um, put um, anything you want in these items. It doesn't have to have a fixed structure. I can have A equal to the number 3 and B equal to false. And it all works. I can even choose uh, not to include a text at all. This is just not recommended, though, because then Meteor will not know what to display. But uh, in each case, we get an ID, and that's the ID of the object you can use. As we continue with step four and step five, the tutorial will show you um, ways that you can create UI elements using the HTML you know um, to create um, different tasks. Let's look at step four really quickly. Um, we'll see that we added a section about events. Templates can have helpers, which get us data, but it can also call events. And this is where stuff becomes useful, because events are what happen when you click on different things on your website. Here, um, there, um, our code is telling us to add this event. Add it when um, you've submitted something with the class new task. Um, what you have here is um, a CSS selector. So this just looks for an HTML element that has the class new task. And it looks for the event, like submit. Other events include click, hover, double click, similar to what you get in normal HTML. What you give it here is now a function. And um, you can um, have your code in that function. This function is what ends up getting called when you submit this new task. Let's um, look at the HTML, just so we understand what this new task is. We've added a form here with class new task. And it has an input with, um, um, that takes text. And this is where we will add our new um, tasks. Let's uh, run a step four in the website to see what it looks like. We can quit first out of the MongoDB we had from our previous example with Control-C. And let's change into the step four directory. We'll run Meteor again to start the server. And unfortunately, I had a Meteor running in another terminal, so I'm just going to make sure this closed. Let's quit this and change um, to part four, step four. OK. Now our Meteor code is running. And um, you can see that it, it updated without us even having to refresh the page. Um, the, what has changed here is now that um, we don't have any tasks, um, but we have um, a form here, this text box, to add our new tasks. And um, we can type our task here. I come from the HTML page. And when I press Enter, it got submitted. We can. Um, see what happened as defined by the JavaScript code. We, what this function did was take the text um, from the form and then just call tasks.insert like we did in the console. Um, they also chose to add a created at date. Um, this is how you would specify the current time. Um, after that, it clears the form by making sure the value is the empty string and then calls return false to make sure nothing else happens. When you return false from a form event, that stops execution. Say a form has an action, like submit to a PHP page. If you had not returned false, you'd return true. It would end up making that request. False intercepts it and stops it right there. So that was a little demo about um, how Meteor works. And we've been following the tutorial um, for a while. And you can please feel free to continue doing this. Um, there are plenty of resources. And the tutorial is actually just um, very good about explaining what's going on. I do want to show you now, in the um, few minutes we have left, 
what are some of the cooler features of Meteor? And um, what are some of the more useful packages? One of the great things about Meteor is that you have a package system. You can easily incorporate code that many thousands of developers have written worldwide into your Meteor project. Um, one example of this is what you might do in step nine of the tutorial, where you are trying to um, add accounts to the, um, your Meteor project. As um, if we have a CS50 um, PHP project, we would have to rely on the framework or code our own um, um, code to make sure we securely handle passwords and usernames and sort in the database and all of that. It turns out Meteor has some packages to do that for you and uh, to do it very easily. Um, what we can do is add um, a few packages. So let's do that right now um, in our console. I'm going to quit the project and right now go into um, simple to do's. Now, Simple To Do's is the project that you will have after being done with um, step 11 or step 12 at the end of this tutorial. And let's quickly look at it to see what are the different features we have. Let's just make sure it's running. All right. Sometimes it takes a while to refresh, but here it is. We have um, an option to hide completed tasks, and uh, we can sign in. And um, this was done with a Meteor package. It's great. We have now username and password sign in. But what if we wanted to add? Um, another kind of login mechanism. Let's say I wanted to log in with my Meteor account. I'm going to run Meteor add, and this is the syntax for adding packages. I can say accounts and um, accounts.meteor. It's going to now find the package and um, load it. Um, you can see that I have not spelled the, I have not found the right package name. So how do you find out about packages? Well, there's a great website made available by um, the Meteor people called AtmosphereJS.com. AtmosphereJS, one word, .com, um, is a great repository for finding all of the um, Meteor packages in the repository. I can search accounts, and then it'll show me all the relevant stuff, all um, accounts, all um, you know, packages with the account's name. While um, that loads, we can try adding some other packages. Maybe the Meteor package isn't working right now, but um, I can add Facebook. Um, I can add the account and then run the Meteor project again. Once this starts, let's see um, what the web what's changed on the website. You can see, um, if I might have to refresh it here, um, I have a button to configure Facebook login. And um, here, I have all the instructions Meteor has prepared for you for setting up a Facebook app. And um, you can um, use that information to um, add your IDs. Once that's done, you'll have Facebook login working in your app. I'm just going to um, get an app ID and a secret. Um, just to show you how this might work. You will need a Facebook account to use uh, Facebook uh, developer options. Um, I can let me just quickly find um, the meteor keys that are necessary. I have another media project that I'm going to use, and I'm just going to take the, um, the keys from that file. And um, once I find it, I'll just be able to copy these keys into um, my Facebook. So here is a key. And this is secret. You should not be sharing this with people. And then you give it your app secret. And this is so Facebook knows you are you. Um, and you save the configuration. 
Um, I think in the process, I have uh, stopped my Meteor app, so I just want to make sure it's uh, still there. Let's see. OK, let's make sure our Meteor server is running so the web page is running. Notice if we stop the Meteor server, um, the page is still there. It just won't update anymore. The Meteor server is necessary for making sure the page is live. OK, I've submitted it, and now I can sign in with Facebook. Now it's just a matter of uh, having a Facebook pop-up and um, putting in your account information and logging in. Once you do that, Facebook might um, nag you for some more security, so we'll just stop there. The point is, is that when you're done with that, you'll have Facebook login. Meteor has a bunch of other packages as well. Um, you can log in with Google+, you can log in with GitHub, you can log in with Twitter. Or if you search, you'll find plenty of other things like Meetup, LinkedIn, and uh, Meteor Developer. So Meteor Developer was the package I was looking for. Meteor Ad, Meteor Accounts, Meteor Developer. In the meantime, I also want to recommend some other packages for your projects. Um, it might prove uh, useful to include the jQuery package. This allows you to use jQuery in your clients. You could just do it with one line, and Meteor will make sure you're up to date on jQuery. Um, I also recommend um, Houston Admin. This is kind of like a PHP My Admin kind of tool for your MongoDB. This allows you to edit your data quite easily without having to go to the Mongo shell, like I had done earlier in the seminar. So now that that's running, let's run Meteor again and um, see what we can do. You notice that like adding some packages might um, have them present some warnings. You won't need to worry about that with Houston. So we can now have the option to configure Meteor um, admin, and they give you the directions if. Um, you want to set that up. We can also now go to slash admin. With, this is brought to you by the Houston package. And um, this is a Meteor admin interface. Um, you just create an admin account, like so. And um, if you refresh the page, um, you, you might have some collections uh, uh, showing up um, it's a very useful tool, and I strongly recommend it. Um, you can see that because Houston was giving some errors, we don't have any collections uh, showing up right now. The way you would use Houston is um, making sure this function gets called in your simple to-dos. So it, Houston doesn't know what my tasks are. We set up a Mongo collection called tasks. Let's um, go into simple to-dos and just make sure that um, in the JavaScript, um, we have added tasks to um, our collections. Okay, we've now saved, and um, it's building the application, refreshing. And let's see. Now we have some tasks, and we can add some new tasks. Um, but if we want to add tasks, let's do it with um, the app itself. Now we can add some data. Hi, this, this is a task. It seems kind of strange that um, we're not seeing any tasks. We might want to check if we got any errors here or maybe somewhere else. If we go into admin, um, that seems strange. If you um, pull the repository after this um, seminar, I will make sure that simple to do's works with Houston. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be working at this very moment. Um, are there any other questions? Um, Houston normally is a tool that works very well. Um, 
Houston specifically is a bit buggier than the other ones, but um, I do recommend it when it works. Yeah? What can you do with the Facebook package once a user is logged in with their Facebook? Uh, once a user is logged in, you can make calls to the Facebook API. Um, that A lot of that lies more in how Facebook opens their API. Meteor, make sure you have the connection. But everything after that is a matter of learning how to use the Facebook API. All right. Um, thank you very much for uh, the CS50 seminar on Meteor. If you have any questions, you can um, email me at um, my email address um, listed below the seminar. And I'll be happy to answer your questions. I'll also be at the CS50 hackathon um, should you need help with your Meteor projects. Thank you for watching.